this is Jess from Stellar Tarot and I'm out in my front garden today in front of my beautiful Rose of Sharon bush to share with you a lot of resources on Druidry. I am resting my arm right now on my stack of books and decks and other things to kind of give you an idea of the types of things that I read, utilize, and work with in, like on a regular basis within my own practice to connect with a druidic aspect to my path. And um, I'm going to share with you those resources today. So I'm going to start off with some divination and like practical tools that I use and then we're going to go um, into some of the books that I use to support those specific tools and then just into books in general. So it's probably no surprise to you guys but I have a couple of OM sets. This is a uh, professional set that I had made, or uh, purchased I should say on Etsy, and um, these are uh, hazel discs and then all of the Oum runes are wood burned into them. So for those of you who don't know what Oum is, this is the original Celtic writing system. Not only is each Oum associated with a different tree, it's also associated with a writing system. It seems as though they primarily use these to mark um, like tallies of different things. They did use it for some basic communication purposes. And there also is some uh, evidence to suggest that it was utilized at times in a divinatory sense. So that is the set that I bought um, from, I think it's called Shamanic Essence. I'll find the shop for you guys though and link it below. And then in this bag, I have my homemade Oum set. I don't have all 25 Oum runes yet, but I'm getting there. I have been collecting them from the trees that they are from. And there's a few I don't have because they don't grow locally or they grow in specific places in my province that I haven't visited yet. So it's not entirely complete, but I'm close. I think I only don't have like three, four at the most. It might even be less than that. But um, all of these are twigs that I harvested and then um, dried and then uh, removed some of the bark and drew and then wood burned the the oum symbol onto so obviously this set is very personal to me i do not use this for other people and it also really helps me to connect with the different trees learning to identify them and learning to um uh, like connect with their energies and things like that so when it comes to working with uh, the oum Probably my two favorite books for that have been um, The Healing Power of Trees by Sherilyn Hidalgo and then The Book of Celtic Magic by Christopher Hughes. Now he stays primarily within the Welsh pantheon and heritage and all that stuff but he does touch on um, Owen in this book as well and I have found it to be quite helpful. Um, most of the time when I want to go back and look over Oum stuff, I do tend to go more towards um, the healing power of trees. However, this book is really great at also talking about like different magical amulets and talismans that may have been used um, by the Celts and uh, that we can use today in modern neo-paganism and neo-druidry. So that's what I primarily use for the Oum. But I have one last way that I really love to connect with the Oum, as well as with energies of trees and the energy of um, the pagan god Carnunos, or the green man. And that is the Spirit of Nature Oracle. This is a newer version. I think they called it the green man oracle, like way back in the 90s and then it went out of print and then this is the the reintroduced version of the deck so 
I really like this. It's a nice sturdy box. It pulls out on the side and the book is really thick as well. I don't always agree with everything that that book has written about OM stuff, but I do really enjoy it. Um, it's one of those things where as I connect more with uh, the OM, I build more and more of my own personal associations with them. And sometimes other people's takes on the trees and the energy don't always match mine. Okay. Um, another way that I like to connect with uh, Celtic and Druidic energy are decks. And these are kind of like my three favorites right here. So I did have the Druid Plant Oracle at one point. I wouldn't mind getting it back in my collection again at some point, but for now I'm satisfied with the Druid Animal Oracle. This is the one that comes with the larger size book and it has a lot more information on each of the animals, including where they come from in mythology and what they're associated with. And there's often some OM incorporated into these uh, specific cards as well, which is always really great when you kind of get that overlap between two systems. Um, it does come with three blank cards so that you can put your own animals into it. I did that for myself last time with the previous copy of this deck that I owned, but I'm not doing it with this one. I'm happy with the animals that are provided in the deck, and I, I don't feel the need to add any other ones. I just don't think that will be enough of an overlap of the, the different animals to... Um, I, get the, I think there will be too much overlap between some of the other animals and, and things like that. Um, these two decks, so this one here is my Wildwood Tarot. And this one I associate far more with Druidry than I do this one, the Druidcraft Tarot. This one is specifically supposed to be a mix between... Um, Druidry and witchcraft. So it's not meant to completely cover all of Druidry and it's not meant to uh, be taken as um, the truest form of expression of that in like a divination form. I do like it, but when it comes to um, Druidic decks, uh, for me, the Wildwood trumps them all. I've trimmed mine. I keep mine always with a citrine and a green calcite. And I just think that this deck is far more, um, just far more Druidic in its depictions. I, I really do. There's green man figures in here. There's animal figures for the court cards, which I know not everybody loves. Um, there's a lot of like very uh, Celtic depictions of a lot of the cards. And it's something that I, yeah, I just, I really love this deck. It's one, it's one of my soul decks, <laughs> one of them. Um, but yeah, this is, I think, a very good deck for working with if you want to get more into Druidry and you want to bring it into your divinations as well. So now we're going to talk books. And we're going to talk a little bit first about um, informative books that I think are good to have um, when you are working with Druidry, and that is knowledge of history and culture. Um, Druidry is a very specific type of practice from a very specific locale and place. And when you try to apply um, outside knowledge and associations to Druidry, you end up with um, a very, uh, inauthentic sounding practice. It's absolutely fine if you want to incorporate elements of Druidry into your practice, but if you are specifically trying to really understand it and get in touch with that energy and incorporate that into your craft, you need a knowledge of history. You just, you really do. So um, I have several books here. Uh, these two are, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get, um, Okay, I'm not sure, 
Yeah, these two might actually be the same. Um, the Druids by Peter Beresford Ellis and then A Brief History of the Druids by Peter Beresford Ellis. Um, they have some of the same uh, praise on the back for them. I'd have to take a look inside um, to be 100% sure, but I believe they're the same book. So anyways, Peter Beresford Ellis is um, an author I've talked about on my channel before when I read this one, which I also recommend because he is a leading authority on uh, Celtic history and all that kind of stuff. And he's one of the few historians that I've heard actually sort of like scrutinizes uh, Roman opinions and uh, retellings and descriptions of Celtic culture because he definitely understands that these people really saw the Celts through a lens that described them as savages and as being less than their own culture simply because they didn't incorporate some of the same technologies that the Romans did. Um, but Celtic technologies in terms of uh, metalworking, and specifically decorative metalworking, a lot of experts believe that those are more advanced than the Romans, as well as a lot of their um, military tactics were quite different from the Romans, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they really gave the Romans a run for their money. Um, and so, yeah, this this author actually scrutinizes uh, descriptions and first-person uh, retellings of Celtic culture and, you know, tries to bring a little bit more reality back into uh, the scope there, which I appreciate. Um, a couple of other of these uh, brief history of books, uh, Celtic Myth and Legends and then Stonehenge is really good at helping you to understand um, some of the mythology, the stories that the Celts did manage to, to pass down to people who did um, write them down. And uh, Stonehenge is obviously a very important uh, Neolithic site that predates Celtic culture but then continued to be used by uh, the Celts in their everyday. I think it's also important to know um, you know what some of the artifacts are and you know what uh, the history of these people would have entailed. So any history books on the Celts themselves and ones that really analyze the culture and then um, any books that really analyze some of the uh, the mythology and the stories that uh, these people created and you know really passed down within their people and within their worlds when you understand some of their stories and some of their mythology and some of their tales you understand them a bit better and i think that's true for any culture when you understand you know the types of stories that they told their kids and what was popular and and the types of stories that they told themselves and each other, you get a really good glimpse into what life would have been like and how they viewed the world. Uh, the Celts are some of the last people in Britain and all of the like surrounding countryside, so Ireland, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and parts of um, mainland Europe like France and Germany. You know, those are some of the last evidence of peoples of like a white Caucasian background that we glimpse having a really intimate connection and reverence for the earth. Because once Christianity takes over, this idea of man being over the land and over nature really becomes predominant. As far as um, bringing practices of druidry into your everyday and understanding a lot of those things, um, I have a few suggestions. So one of them is this great one, The Path of Druidry by Penny Billington. I've talked about this book on my channel before. It is an amazing resource if you want to get into druidry, into that Celtic paganism mindset like now. Um, another really good one that uh, I actually read with our book club 
uh, quite a while ago, and that's the book of Celtic Magic by Christopher Hughes. I think this book just doesn't get enough attention because it's not Ireland and Scotland and Britain focused Celtic paganism, it's Welsh. And Welsh doesn't get a lot of, um, it doesn't get a lot of attention these days within the pagan community. And I think that's really a shame because Wales is where we see some of the last holding out of unique and different culture within all of the British Isles and that surrounding area. There are still some traditions in Wales that hold today, including this intricate and difficult to understand language. And this book really goes into a lot of those deities, a lot of those practices, and gives you a really good understanding of history and mythology, but also how to make it modern and bring it into your regular practice. It also specifically focuses on the teachings of the Awan, which is um, a major part of Druidry that sometimes gets like pushed off to the side as being something that you can learn about later. But when it comes to Druidry, Awan is like a huge portion of it. It is the magic. It is the practice. It is the viewpoint. It, it, like, it is the basis for everything and you need to have a good understanding of it to really make a lot of progress in your practice. Then we have a couple of other random books here. Um, a Druid's Herbal for the Sacred Earth Year. This is really good if you want to incorporate um, herbs and plants into your Druidry, uh, like actual magical or Awenic practice. So if you are trying to figure out what type of incense you want to make for a ritual, if you're trying to figure out uh, what types of plant energies to work with at specific Sabbaths around the years, stuff like that, this book is going to have you pretty well covered. Um, um, I really enjoy this. There is a, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ways to incorporate the, the herbs into uh, your everyday practice, but it also goes specifically um, Sabbath by Sabbath so that you have a really good idea of what would have been worked with in different parts of um, the Celtic and the Druidic areas because obviously the plant life, the flora, the fauna is not exactly the same all over the place. Different parts of Britain get different weather, same with Scotland, same with Wales, same with Ireland and the Isle of Man. There are similar threads and some generic things that you can kind of say between all of them, but the types of plants that grew within all the different regions certainly did vary, just as it does for us here. Um, you know, a two hour drive from here takes me to slightly different uh, types of plant life. Four hour drive, even more different. Six hour drive, we are talking a complete and utter change in the landscape, and maybe some of the animals will be the same, but their way of living will be slightly different for that specific area. Um, the Druids, Celtic Priests of Nature. This is a new book to me, um, and it is pretty thorough from, uh, it's actually written originally in 1985, so this book is as old as I am. I'm sure there's going to be some research in this book that has been disproven, some theories that is no longer viable and valid within the modern day, but I have enough working knowledge of Celtic history that I'll be able to sort of weed that out. If you are a true beginner, this might not be a good book to start with. Um, however, it does really give a rundown on all of the basics of Druidry from the deities that they worked with, where Druidry originated from, um, their place in society, where their name comes from, what it means, uh, different plant rituals, how they worked with the elements, uh, different rituals that they would perform like sacrifices, bardic practices, which were huge, um, and then shamanism. So that is this one thing I'm gonna touch on really quickly. Modern Druids now are tending to kind of veer away from the word shaman and 
and they are using another term instead, which is less culturally appropriative, and that is seership. So shaman comes from a very specific name that people had uh, within a certain culture. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is right now. And it basically describes uh, somebody who works as like the village healer, but also knows the history, um, understands the plants and the medicine in the world around them, uh, is able to move into alternate states of consciousness, which is sometimes thought of as the shamanic state of consciousness, to move to upper, middle, and lower worlds to help with different um, energetic healing, as well as administering physical herbal healing as well, and things that we would now consider like basic uh, doctoral and medical practices like stitching and cleaning out wounds, uh, setting broken bones, minor surgeries, things like that. Uh, shamans were the one-stop shop for the village, for the community, and their learning took place over decades. They usually started young, apprenticing to somebody who had already been doing it for a long time, and then learning stuff from that person over the course of years and years and years. So this is essentially the role of a druid. And when we are talking specifically about their uh, magical practices, the rituals that they would perform, how they would connect their communities to the, um, the, the energies of the divine and of the sacred in their own realms, that type of practice when they move to alternate states of consciousness, when they're performing priest and priestess type roles, that is the aspect of Druidry that we now call seership. And um, for me, it's a term I'm going to be using more when I refer to any type of um, Druidic type role or shamanic type role that is not specifically from the uh, culture that came up with the word sh shaman. So that's just what uh, I'm personally going to do and what a lot of the Druidry community is moving towards. Um, the last book that I want to recommend to you guys is uh, The Mist Filled Path, Celtic Wisdom for Exiles, Wanderers, and Seekers. This is so much more of a Druidry um, resource book for those who know that they're pretty much going to be completely and utterly solitary. Um, it is more of the, you know, how you can go about uh, including this practice in your spiritual practice without having to lean on others for ritual, for support, for any of that kind of stuff. It is definitely more for the, um, the, the free spirit or the wild at heart who wants a structure within Druidry but doesn't want to stick to any one specific structure. Um, the author Frank McEwen, McEwen, I'm sorry, they are Scottish, Irish, American poet, teacher, uh, says shamanist in the visionary traditions of his Celtic ancestors. So he also um, performs a lot of those druidic type uh, practices, those seership type practices, moving to alternate states of uh, consciousness in order to facilitate energetic healing for people as well as leading rituals and other types of things. He is American, so he, um, and born in Mississippi it says, so he's also able to kind of offer some of that um, perspective of somebody who wants to connect with druidry and Celtic spirituality who is on the North and South American side of the hemisphere. For those of us who know that the majority of our roots reach back to that area, if you haven't been there yet, physically traveled there, it can sometimes be hard to connect with that energy. So it's always really great when, um, you know, for people like me to have a book written by somebody like that who is, um, you know, in some of the same boats that I am, you know, 
similar ancestry and and you know being descended from the same types of people feeling this connection for this land that we've never physically been to but that we know that our ancestors were there and practiced these practices that is really um, a nice powerful draw for me because it definitely I have a lot in common with this guy you know what I mean um, okay, so another couple of resources I just want to finish off this video with are some places that you can go to learn more about Druidry and uh, then a couple of channels that I think that you guys should check out. So there are two big um, Druidic organizations online that you can become a member of. Uh, for those of you with a lack of or very low budget, the uh, New Order of Druidry is a really good place to check out. I am personally a member on that site and actively taking one of their courses right now. It requires you to read their material and then write comprehensive academic style essays reflecting at, after every chapter on what the material is teaching you but also how you can incorporate this stuff often asking you to compare and contrast uh, early druidry you know that descended from the real thing and then what we do in modern druidry and how we can incorporate some of that <clears throat> uh, the um, druidry.org, the order of Ovates, Bards, and Druids, a lot of whom the members these books have been written by, is also an extremely good comprehensive uh, group to belong to and one that I am aspiring to belong to myself. Unfortunately, with the global climate right now and the pandemic, uh, the this is not a good time for uh, monetary exchange rates, particularly if you're in a country like Canada, who always kind of struggles to keep up with countries like the States and countries in Europe. So right now I'm holding off on hitting uh, purchase on my membership there, but it is something that I intend to join at some point. Um, one of the most prolific writers on all things Druidry is Philip Cargom. He and his wife Stephanie have written so many books and articles and um, been co-authors and co-creators of decks like uh, the Druid Craft Tarot, the Druid Plant and Animal Oracles, and some of their other friends like John Matthews have also, you know, written or co-written or helped with or written introductions to a lot of these and other books, um, and, and a lot of decks as well. So it is a really good, uh, he is a really good author to check out on anything really within the druidic and pagan community if he's written it you can pretty much guarantee that he has done extensive research and any rituals or things that are suggested are things that he probably will have tried himself or written himself and structured because he knows that they work um, he's a very active member in our community and he is somebody to really like somebody that I really look up to and really admire um, he has his own YouTube channel, which I will link below, and my favorites are the Tea with the Druid videos that he does because he live streams them. So even if you can't join him live, you get to watch them on the playback. And they're always informative and yet very casual. You really do feel like you are sitting in his living room having a cup of tea with him, which is something that I know a lot of you guys say that you love about my videos, that they're really... Um, you know like down to earth and warm welcoming types of homes and you definitely get that feeling with Philip Cargom's channel so I highly recommend his anything he's done to you anything but especially his books and his YouTube channel the last resource I want to recommend for you is a YouTuber who hasn't created anything in a while, but she's still active on Instagram and she's done a lot of really good uh, comprehensive book reviews of some of the books that we've talked about here today. And that is Danny from Esoteric Moment. I absolutely adore 
her channel. I love her Instagram feed. I love all the stuff that she's really put out because she is very much into bringing druidry into so many aspects of her life. I know she's also a permaculture nut, a gardener, she lives on a farm, and um, she's also the leader of one of her own local groves, which I think is just wonderful. And there's something about the way that she addresses all of us as saplings at the beginning of every video that just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. And again, she's someone I feel like I could just like hang out with them in their living room one day and have a cup of tea and then maybe go hang out in her grove and do a little druidry with together and just feel really, really good about it. Um, I am going to leave this video here because it is already a half an hour long and I'm sure that's long enough that some of you guys are always, already itching to go check out some of these links I've given you, some of these book suggestions, deck suggestions, etc. Um, if you are on the Druidry path yourself and would like to connect more with me, of course you can always follow me on my uh, different social media handles. I'm most active on Instagram and here on on YouTube but I also have a Facebook page and a Facebook book club group that you can come and join for free as long as you answer the questions that are asked at the beginning of um, the group entry process. Uh, if you would like to get a reading with me you can click on the shop link below and I also have pagan prayer beads there some of which are very much centered on deities and energies that are uh, that we connect with as druids. And I also offer tarot learning resources there, including uh, workbooks and all sorts of good stuff. So I hope that you will check out my Etsy shop below. And until next time, guys, take care of yourselves, wear a mask, and as I always like to say, be wise, be brave, and be magical. Bye.